Hey folks, so it's been roughly two weeks since Plunderstorm first came out, and at this point I'd say the balancing has mostly settled down. Early on, Blizzard was doing pretty frequent changes to a lot of these abilities, but more recently, there hasn't been anything major, and I feel that overall, the tuning of these abilities, for the most part, is pretty good. There's actually a lot of really good variety in which abilities you can use to win a match, but Obviously, some are better than others, so I wanted to wait until things had gotten a bit more finalized to sit down and make this definitive tier list on what the best and worst abilities are in Plunderstorm. Now, obviously, for the purpose of a tier list like this, my criteria is going to be which abilities help you win a match. I know some people are approaching this just for renown farming, and in that case, abilities like Star Bomb may be really good for you because you just shoot them at elites, you one-shot the elite, you get the plunder, you move on, and you don't really care about killing players. But for the purposes of this video, we're going to be looking at things from a competitive angle. What do you want to use if you are trying to win matches as easily, quickly, whatever as possible? And I'm only going to be talking about the main things, the attacks, the utility spells, not the items, because items are a little bit different, right? They, you know, they're one-time use, they have different use cases, like each one is kind of niche, and because they all have their special place, it's kind of hard to say that one item is good or bad, because a lot of them you just kind of fire off, and it's good in that situation, and you don't get it back, so... Eh, you can't really compare it one-to-one -one with everything else, but obviously with these abilities you can only hold two attacks, you can only hold two utility spells, so there is a very clear distinction between what you want to use and what you don't want to use. So, starting things off, I want to talk about pretty much the top and bottom of the tier list. What do I think the absolute best abilities are, and what do I think the worst abilities are? And after that, we'll fill in the middle a little bit and just go one by one. So for starters... I think the single best ability in Plunderstorm is Slicing Winds. Now, I have been a pretty big advocate of Slicing Winds being absolutely bonkers since the very early days of Plunderstorm. This ability is nuts. More recently, I've noticed other people starting to realize just how good it is, and I'm glad because, God, I cannot believe that for the longest time, nobody really truly understood just how strong this is, and everybody kept saying, oh, Fire World's amazing, Fire World's amazing. Fire Whirl was never as good as most people seem to think, and my position of it in this tier list will reflect that. Now, Slicing Winds, on the other hand, it is a little bit hard to use. I think that's the main advantage of something like Fire Whirl, where Fire Whirl, you just press a button, does damage. Slicing Winds, you need to charge it up. You need to make sure that you're getting the right distance for it by ranking it up. And it also requires you to aim pretty precisely, because if you don't hit the target like with the right part of the hitbox, you don't get any damage, it can be really finicky to use, but once you learn how to use Slicing Winds, oh my goodness, this ability is stupidly strong. For two main reasons, one, the mobility that it provides is ludicrous, and this is not just in a combat setting. So, Slicing Winds gets you so much distance just across the map when you use it out of combat, just dashing from point A to point B, and mobility in this game is critical. This isn't like a lot of other battle royales where, you know, you sit in a corner with a sniper rifle and just wait for people to walk into your line of fire, shoot them in the head, and you just camp in a bush basically the whole time. Because Plunderstorm has a leveling system and you have to kill mobs, well, you need to be running across the map nonstop. Even if you get like an epic slicing winds right after you land, you're still level 1, you still gotta reach level 10 if you want your stuff to scale properly, and that means mobility is king. Being able to just sweep across the map, kill as many mobs as possible, and level up and get that plunder, it is critical. So Slicing Winds helps you do that phenomenally, and initially I was just using it for that. I was like, okay, yeah, it's a good ability for early in the game. You pick it up, you dash around, what's not to love? But then when I realized that you can just chain some ridiculous combos with it, just dashing through people so that they couldn't actually stop you, you just hit them, they can't react, you immediately spin around, combo up with abilities, such as Toxic Smackerel, which I'm also putting in S tier. And that is the next strength of Slicing Winds, but it requires other abilities. Toxic Smackerel is by far the strongest general purpose ability to go with Slicing Winds. I think both of these ones, they're going to be the only attacks in S tier, I should say right now, they are really strong because you can combo them with almost anything, and they are just ludicrously powerful. Now, I would say this combo in particular is just by far the strongest attack combo in the game. I have won 
probably like 80% of my Plunderstorm wins with this setup. Once you get it, it's just powerful. It, it's overpowered, I would say. And even like a level one Toxic Smackerel is sometimes better than level four for a lot of other ones, especially when you have Slicing Winds to combo with it. Now, Toxic Smackerel is a really weird one because when I first started playing this game, I thought it was complete and utter rubbish. And it did get buffed, but honestly, I was starting to realize that it was better than I thought before the buffs even happened. Because Smackerel is an ability that gets better and better the more you're able to consistently land it. If you're just getting one hit off every now and then, it's honestly not that great. It, it does some good stuff, right? It does decent damage, and the poison effect is really strong because it just completely cripples the enemy. If they try to use things like the barrel and escape like that, the tick will break their barrel. It just completely screws them over, makes it harder for them to respond to your attacks. But more importantly, when an enemy is poisoned, if you hit them again with Toxic Smackerel, it deals significant bonus damage. So this combo is really nice because Slicing Winds, if you have this and you know how to use it, you will never be off the target. You will just be on their ass constantly, especially if you have other abilities like in the utility combo to go along with it. So you're just on somebody nonstop. They cannot get away from you no matter what they have. And every single time Toxic Smack Roll is off cooldown, boom, you ping them with it. Easier to do if it's a higher rank and obviously then it's doing more damage, but you will just relentlessly hunt people down, smack them with the fish constantly, whap, 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 and it just finishes them off. Now, that is the key for this particular combo, but Smackerel also works really well in a lot of other settings, even without Slicing Winds. Uh, another big one, which I guess we could talk about now, is Rhyme Arrow, which I'm not going to put in S tier, but I will put it in A. Rhyme Arrow and Smackerel is another combo that I like to use a lot because it's very much like an annoying combo. You're not actively trying to kill somebody, right? You don't have the insane burst potential of something like, you know, Searing Axe or Fire Whirl, etc. But you're just pinging them slowly. You're hitting them with the fish, you're kiting a little bit, hitting them with Rhyme Arrow, doing a little bit of poke damage. And if you have good utility spells to where they can't reach you, you're effectively just chipping somebody down and they will never get a chance to heal. So I would say in a pure 1v1 setting, Rhyme Arrow plus Smackerel might actually be stronger than Slicing Wind Smackerel. It's a little bit close. This is obviously very strong. The advantage, of course, of Slicing Winds is that if you're fighting against multiple people, so something I like to do for fun is I like to queue up uh, solo for a duos game and then just go off on my own and try to 1v2 enemy teams. And in that case, Slicing Winds is nuts because being able to slice through two people because a lot of random duos teams, they like clump up together. They're basically constantly hugging each other. So you can just dash around them, slice right through them, spin around, smack roll both of them, and just keep dancing out of range of all their abilities and just chip away at them. Slice, smack, slice, smack. Really powerful. And then of course the utility aspect of it. Rhyme Arrow, it doesn't quite have that. Early in the game, it's honestly one of my least favorite abilities. If I get this super early on, I'm kind of upset because it just doesn't do a lot to mobs. It's not really good in early game fights because if somebody has really good mobility and they're chasing you down, there's not a lot you can do with it. Rhyme Arrow is really good when you have your utility spells, you have the ability to keep a distance from a target and you can just keep escaping them and poking them. And whenever they try to heal and disengage, you poke them from a distance, interrupt their heal. It's really good at doing that. And it's the only ability that is completely unaimed, right? I don't know. That's the right way to say it. You can just target somebody, click it, and it does direct damage. It's the only direct damage spell. That's a better way of putting it. And that is just a really useful thing to have to the point where, while I wouldn't consider Rhyme Arrow to be overpowered per se, I don't feel it belongs in this game. And I kind of hope it gets reworked at some point because direct damage like this is just kind of unhealthy for the state of the game. Like Smack Roll's really broken and probably needs a nerf. Slicing Winds also needs a nerf. I think the bigger thing with Slicing Winds is it should probably have its cooldown increased because Epic Slicing Winds is really where it starts to get spooky. At late game with Epic Slicing Winds and you have it like every five seconds and you're just impossible to catch. And with Smackerel, you can just chain that combo back and forth. If it had a slightly longer cooldown, it would still be very strong, but you wouldn't be able to abuse it quite as much. Rhyme Arrow is... It's interesting because they did increase the cooldown on it. They nerfed it. 
But the biggest issue that I have with it is I've gotten into endgame situations sometimes where I'm against like three other people and they all have Rhyme Arrow and I just kind of lose because when they realize that I don't have Rhyme Arrow, they just all target me. And it doesn't matter how good I am at dodging. If I'm getting chipped down by three people, I don't have a chance to heal. They're all watching me like a hawk. The moment I go for a heal, they chip away at me. And you just can't really counter that. It doesn't happen often. Usually if I see that somebody has Rhyme Arrow, I wait. I try to like get off into the distance, bait out their Rhyme Arrow. And the moment it hits me, then I start my heal. So at least I'm getting in like little chips of healing outside their poke damage. But it can be a little bit oppressive in the right scenario. But I don't think it's overbearing. You'll probably notice it's going to end up being lower A tier when we fill out the rest. But because Smackerel and Rhyme Arrow is a very specific combo that I've seen a lot of people using and I think is very good, I wanted to talk about that. Now, these are three of the strongest attacks. Let's talk about some utility spells. The only other S tier entry is going to be Fade to Shadow. This one is... It's interesting, because I think when we're looking at utility abilities, obviously attacks, right, your main concern is doing damage. Smackerel just does damage. It has you know, the utility effect of it poisons them, but it's mostly just there to just destroy people really quickly, and especially when we look at things like Searing Axe later, their main purpose is damage. Now, utility spells, the main three things that I'd say they give you is extra mobility, like escape or cross the map. Uh, Fade to Shadow is pretty good at that. It gives you a blink, so it can get you some distance. It's not its main purpose. And survivability. So later on, we'll talk about stuff like Lightning Bulwark, Repel. This makes it harder for people to kill you, so it's a really good defensive option. And most importantly, crowd control. A lot of the strongest, in my opinion, uh, utility spells are very CC-based, so they can either stop people from attacking you or let you set up a combo by stunlocking somebody. And Fade to Shadow is interesting because it doesn't really do that. It's kind of unique. The stealth aspect of it doesn't really fit into any of those categories. You could argue it's like defensive because people can't reach you. But I actually think that the best use case of Fade to Shadow is as an offensive ability. You blink into somebody. They can't really anticipate where you're going to attack. And especially with Slicing Wind, Smackerel, and Fade to Shadow, this is, I would say, the god comp. There are other utility spells that you can pair with these three. But Fade to Shadow, I've taken, once again... Level 1 Fade to Shadows over epics of pretty much any other utility spell if I get to like the final four, because just having the stealth, no other ability gives you that except that one smoke bomb item, which isn't really consistent. It lets you do so much disgusting stuff. You slice through somebody, you smack roll them. They go to hit you with a searing axe, you blink through them with Fade to Shadow, now you're stealthed. A lot of times I see people just panic and they'll like fire off a mana sphere, fire off a windstorm in some random direction. Obviously, if your opponent is good, they will just sit there and wait, but there really isn't much they can do, because you just kind of sneak around them, the stealth lasts for a pretty long time, all things considered, and the moment smack roll is off cooldown, you hit them with a smack roll, you stay out of range, they usually try to reach you, then you can slice back in, smack roll again, and if you have like epic fade to shadow, you're immediately stealthed again, you can combo into another smack roll, there are times where you're just destroying somebody 100-0 with this setup, and there is just nothing they can do to stop you. Especially attacking from stealth with that smack roll, oh, it is dirty, 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 dirty. But then on top of that, having the ability to blink out of stuff like Starbomb, like Earthbreaker, if somebody hits you with a steel trap, so you blink right out of that, and then they can't follow up. There are so many things that that blink will save you from. There really aren't any other blink abilities. There's abilities that have leaps that will like simulate a blink but they aren't a true blink you can still get caught by roots or stuns or things like that it is a ridiculously powerful utility spell two things in one blink and stealth that nothing else in this game provides i don't know what the future of plunderstorm holds i don't know if they're going to add other spells that have a blink on it that have some sort of stealth mechanic but right now fade to shadow just does Two things that nothing else can, and both of them are obscenely broken. So it's ridiculously powerful for defensive builds. If somebody's diving you, you can get out. If you're trying to set up an offensive combo, it's perfect for that too. There's really no situation where this is bad at any stage of the game. Now, like I said, this is the end of the S tier because as I mentioned before, these abilities I feel are the strongest in the game. 
I think that all of them have ridiculous use cases in pretty much any sort of builds. Windstorm, even if you're not using it as a main damage dealer, can still be a great mobility tool. Smackerel just does ludicrous damage, and Fade to Shadow is just the best utility spell in the game, bar none. So we've talked a lot about some of the good offensive options, and in this case, defensive option, but let's go to the other side. What are the worst abilities in the game? Well, the worst ability in the game, by far, I think, is Storm Archon. Now, I do know, like, a few people who like this ability and say that it's they don't hate it, but usually the thing that I hear from people who like Storm Archon is, well, I like that, you know, it, it's easy for me to hit, right? If somebody's diving me, I just press it and a line shoots out and I get damage. And I, I feel bad for saying this, especially because I don't know if they're going to watch this, but some of the people I know obviously have told me that they like Storm Archon are my friends. But I get the feeling that the people who like Storm Archon are the people who aren't really good at playing games like this. And they're not really good at aiming. And look, that no shade, right? If you feel that you like Storm Archon and you like the way it plays, by all means. But at the end of the day, what we're talking about here is the best abilities to win a game with, and Storm Archon just isn't it. I will at least give the disclaimer that it is slightly, and I mean slightly better in duos than in solos. In solos, this thing is just unusable. I have never, ever managed to get any value out of this whatsoever. I've had times where I have an epic Storm Archon and I hit all three shots, and it does less damage than like a Grey Searing Axe. Uh, there's just really nothing that you can do with this. The only advantage to Storm Archon in duos, in which case I maybe, and, and I, this is like a very big reach, I'd maybe move it up to C tier, is if you have a very defensive playstyle and you're playing with somebody who is like hyper aggressive, you can sit back and you can use Storm Archon and like ping the person that your partner is diving while they keep them busy, right? So there's no way that the person is diving you. But if somebody is diving you, right? You just can't do shit with this ability. It's terrible. It's not good at range because it's really hard to hit the shots if somebody knows how to juke even reasonably well. And generally speaking, you're not going to be fighting much at range because a lot of the abilities in this game mode are close combat abilities. Storm Archon, aside from Rhyme Arrow, is like the only long distance spell. And this is just not that type of game. And if somebody is up in your face, first off, sitting there and casting those lines makes you extremely vulnerable. The amount of times I see somebody press Storm Archon and I just go, yes, easy kill, because I just sidestep their thing, smack roll them, and they're sitting there trying to like hit me point blank with these lines, and I'm just sidestepping, sidestepping, oh, another smack roll hit, and they've landed maybe one line on me, I'm at 80%, they're ticking down from the poison and at like 20%, what are they gonna do? It is just not good. And even like the raw damage for mob farming just doesn't seem great. Like I've seen people say it's good for killing multiple mobs, but like slicing wins, you just quickly one tap it and just spin through a bunch of mobs at point blank range, does a lot of damage. Toxic smack roll, get a bunch of mobs, hit them twice with it, does a ton of damage. Even rhyme arrow, early game farming, not the best, but you can like tag mobs at a distance, drag them in, cleave them with your auto attack. And there's so many other abilities that are much better for farming mobs. Storm Archon, in many cases, feels like a slightly better auto attack if you land all three, because it takes so long to get the cast off. I don't even know how they're going to balance this, which I think is maybe why they haven't, because it's a very hard ability to balance, because if you make it just do ridiculous damage, then the meta becomes drop into point blank range with somebody and hit them with effectively three searing axes back to back, and that's just dumb, so you can't really overtune it. And if you encourage people to play at range, like an idea that I had to fix Storm Archon, or buff it at least, is encourage people to try to snipe long range, like at the end of the line, it does an explosion. So you fire off the lightning line, and then it does like a big circular explosion at the very tip of it. So you're kind of encouraged to hit people with the very end and hit those like long range skill shots, but once again, it just doesn't really work with this game mode, because then if somebody gets on top of you, then what are you going to do, right? Like, just hope that they decide to disengage and magically you hit them with, like, the end of it. So I don't know. I, I just don't think it really works in this format at all. I think maybe it's just one of those where you just remove the ability and take the flavor of it and do something else with it. Because I like the idea. Fundamentally, it's cool, but 
the idea of a long range ping thing, it's just a worse rhyme arrow in every conceivable way. It's bad. I not much else to say. I feel bad for the people who like Storm Archon and are going to be mad at me, but I think I've talked to enough people who firmly agree with me on this one. So this I know I'm not talking out of my ass here. I've spoken to many people who are like, yeah, OK, this is also definitely the worst ability. And to give you an idea of how bad I think this is, it is the only ability in D tier. I considered not even putting a D tier because I think the balance in this game mode is actually pretty good. But I feel that Storm Archon is such an outlier in terms of how poorly it performs. I had to include the D tier just to place this in here. Everything else will at least be in C tier because I think every single other ability in this game at least has some niche use case, which is like if I wanted to name the tiers, S would obviously be ludicrously broken. This is what you want to pick if you want to win. A is also really great contenders for winning builds. They can carry on their own and generally speaking, they can be built around, but just not quite as good as these. B, I would consider to be strong abilities in the right setup. These are going to be things that when you have all your other like three abilities to combo with it, it can work really well. But if you get it like as your first ability after landing, eh, you're not super happy. And C is relatively underwhelming. Generally speaking, you're not going to be happy if you're entering like the final five players with one of these abilities in your setup. It can be OK after you land, but it's just generally speaking only good in very specific scenarios and doesn't really have a lot of synergies. Um, speaking of which, let me talk about the next worst ability, which I believe is Hunter's Chains. And this is probably going to be a bit of a controversial one. Actually, I'm going to say maybe it's not. It's either one of these two. I'm putting them both in C tier. And I think they're both pretty bad. They're both, in my opinion, the two worst utility spells in the game by a pretty sizable margin. Which one is worse, I think, depends. And Snowdrift, I don't think many people will be surprised by. Snowdrift is just... It's not terrible. Because I think the one nice thing about Snowdrift is it is an okay mob farming utility spell. It does a decent bit of AoE damage, so if I get it as like one of my first things, I'm still not happy. But at least early on for XP farming, I can use it to kill off mobs and then replace it later on. And I have gotten some decent early game kills using Snowdrift. Like I get some sort of searing axe or something and then i snow drift slow the target do a bit of poke damage and then follow up with a searing axe because the slow makes it so they can't escape as easily but this is specifically in the early game when people don't have all of the other things that let them escape it because in the late game what is snow drift going to do for you it doesn't do any sizable amount of damage so it's just not really helpful as like a kill helping tool right later in the game it's not going to work with any of your other stuff in any meaningful way. So the only real reason you would want to take this is for the slow, but there are so many ways to avoid the slow, even just that we've already seen, like Fade to Shadow, Slicing Winds. If you Slicing Winds out of the slow, it's not going to stop you in your tracks. You're just going to be a little bit slower immediately after slicing out of it, and then you could just Fade to Shadow and blink away, and they're not going to follow up with it. It doesn't stop you, especially the main issue with Snowdrift is if there were no other hard stop, like root you in place or stun you crowd control abilities, this might have some place. But as we'll talk about, there are so many other abilities that do what Snowdrift is trying to do, but much better. So why would you ever take this? I just don't think it has a use case. I actually changed my mind about Hunter's Chains. It's not the worst ability. Snowdrift is for utility. Uh, second worst above Storm Archon, just because I, I don't really think this has a use case. If it wasn't at least somewhat decent, as an early game farming tool. Like, we'll talk about Steel Traps later. I like Steel Traps in certain settings, but it's not good for early game. If I get this as my first thing, even Windstorm, like these two abilities, they are crowd control abilities. So if you get them early on, you're like, fuck, I can't really do anything with this right now. I guess I just hold on to it and hope I get something later. Snowdrift at least is okay in that stage of the game. Not much else. And Hunter's Chains is in a similar position I don't necessarily know if I should say it's better or worse. I think it's it's worse in the early game because this basically does nothing for farming mobs. It's good for two things. And probably the only reason I'm not putting it in D tier is because it actually does in some way counter slicing winds. It is one of the only semi-reliable counters to slicing winds 
because if somebody is running this build, Slice and Wind, Smack Roll, Fade to Shadow, and then X, X being any of the good utility spells we'll talk about, then they are able to just escape all of your stuff. So if you're running like a Searing Axe build, a Star Bomb build, and you're trying to get in close range with somebody and lock them down, and they keep just slicing out of there, well, then Hunter's Chains will yank them back to you and allow you to set something up. The problem with that is Hunter's Chains and Snowdrift are completely countered by, I think I need to talk about this to explain why these abilities are so bad, Fae Form. Fae Form is personally my favorite ability to combo with this stuff. The only reason I'm not putting it in S tier, and I would have pretty much up until like a week ago, is because there are abilities that fill different niches than Fae Form. It is no longer brokenly overpowered because early on, this ability gave you a 90% damage reduction for its duration, and it was just... It was up here. It was the strongest ability in the game. It was broken. Like, you just got Fae Form in one games if you knew how to use it properly. Now, it is not ludicrously overpowered because it's not a 90% DR on top of everything else, which the DR component has been removed completely. That's how broken it was. But Fae Form still is super duper strong. It's a really good mobility tool, so getting it early, you can traverse the map super easily. It makes you completely immune to any sort of crowd control effects. And you can also use it while you're stunned or CC'd. So it doesn't really matter if you manage to land any crowd control abilities. Fae Form just kind of completely shits on everything. It's just kind of really difficult to justify using any of these things, right? Where if I'm running Slicing Winds, Toxic Smack Roll, Fade to Shadow, well, obviously I'm going to go for Fae Form because the only things that really counter me, basically things that root me in place, Slicing or Windstorm, which we'll talk about later, Hunter's Chains, kind of Snow Drift, um, Steel Traps, right? All that stuff, I just completely negate its existence by taking Fae Form, so I usually do. These four abilities are my go-to setup for winning games. There's other ones that I've played around with if I, you know, don't get a good Fae Form, but... It is just really, really, really strong. And it's good even if you're playing a defensive game, right? If you're trying to get somebody to walk into your steel traps and set up a combo, and they also have steel traps, well, then you can fey form through their steel traps. That's something I think a lot of people don't realize. If you run on top of a trap while in fey form, it just disappears. You can aggressively press fey form, just charge over all of the steel traps, which I guess we'll, we'll throw this here and then talk about it later. So many people live and die by their steel trap little box there. They play around it, they try to bait you into it, and if you just negate all their traps, they don't know what to do. They just sit there completely helpless. So Fae Form is really good in all situations. Also, if you get stunned, right, if you fall into somebody's traps, oh, well, you can just press Fae Form, immediately break the root, and walk out of it. This ability has been nerfed into the ground, like I said, and I still think it needs more nerfs, just because it's the only thing that it does what it does, I think Fae Form should probably not be usable after you've already been stunned or rooted. I think that is a little bit too broken, and I say that loving that part of it because it is so strong, but I feel dirty every time I get stunned by a windstorm or get caught by a trap and then just press Fae Form and I'm alive, and I think to myself, I should have been punished there because I made a mistake walking into that, and yet I, I'm just not. I can walk out of it. And I think this would still be a very strong ability, maybe not like top of A tier, but at least A tier, but maybe high B tier, even if it didn't have that component. Because you can still, if using it properly, play it aggressively, run over those steel traps. If you see that somebody's about to windstorm you, preemptively Fae Form, negate the windstorm, and just run off. There are so many good use cases for this ability. It is really strong. I was tempted to put it in S tier, but I do think that these three are a cut above. And... I, I don't know if I explicitly said it, but with Hunter's Chains, if you run out of somebody's Hunter's Chain circle while in Fae Form, it just snaps and nothing happens. So if this ability is just completely shut down by one of the strongest utility spells in the game. The only use case for it is negating Slicing Winds if somebody doesn't have Fae Form. And there's just better things for that. There, There's so many ways to combo people into your attack spells like close range stuff and hunter's chains is really poor because as i said earlier the things that you want out of a utility spells you want something that gives you defensive value you want something that gives you mobility and crowd control and 
if possible, damage. That's like a bonus. And Hunter's Chains gives you a slight amount of damage, nothing really significant. If you activate the ability before the chain snaps and pulls somebody to you, you can charge to them. But as a crowd control ability, it's not really consistent. The pull to the player isn't really great. It is notably better in duos than in solos if your team is built around it. But you generally need to have a really good partner, right? So random duos out of the question. If you have a really good team where your partner has like a, a defensive setup with maybe Earthbreak or Star Bomb or something, and you Hunter's Chain somebody while your, your partner is charging up a Star Bomb and you like drag them into the Star Bomb and perfectly time it, which mind you, not easy to do and still completely countered by Form. But if you pull that off, you can set up some really dirty combos. I have yet to see anybody pull it off on me, but I always think about this theoretically, and I've been trying to convince a lot of my friends to, like, play duos with me so I could test this stuff out, but, you know, not a lot of them are as into Plunderstorm as I am. But it has some use cases in duos, not so much in solos. And I still think, like, that is... That is one use case when I genuinely believe that in duos, it is just better to play double aggressive setup, right? Slicing wind, smack roll, and just dive people, absolutely erase them from existence, and then just move on to the next duo. It's just stronger. So this is kind of like a use case that you can do if you're playing with a super coordinated duos partner, and you guys happen to only get offered this stuff. The bigger issue with Hunter's Chains, and this is something I don't see talked about enough, is it's very easily exploitable against you if you have it. The amount of times where I see somebody Hunter's Chains me, and I intentionally get myself yanked back, and then smack roll them in the face, and then immediately blink away, and then start up my combo, it's, it's happened way too many times. A lot of people will chain you when they do not know whether they are in an advantageous position. Generally speaking, because of that, if you're smart about Hunter's Chains, you can only press this once you know which spells your opponent has. Because if I have Hunter's Chains, and my opponent has Searing Axe, I am just not pressing this ability. Because half the time, if I am letting them jump to me, they are actually going to deal more damage to me with that Searing Axe by getting pulled directly on top of me than I will be able to do with whatever I have. Unless I literally have a god comp with Hunter's Chains, like drag them into a steel traps into i also have searing axe and i follow up immediately with that maybe but so many times people just pull me back and i kill them because they just aren't prepared it's just a really difficult ability to use properly you can also just very easily play around it even if you don't have fey form right like if you get changed and you're not immediately dragged back because you're outside of the range so if i know somebody has hunter's chains i'll try to stay in like kind of a dead zone not too close to where they can hit me, but not too far where I immediately get pulled back. They chains me, and then I just kind of dance around the edge of the circle. Just not going out of it. If they try to move further away, I just follow them, go in their direction. The moment their thing expires, I'm out of there. I'm running. And by the time that they can actually reach me and cast Hunter's Chains again, I'm too far away. You know, it's out of range. So they can't press it again. And usually, if you're taking Hunter's Chains, it means that that is one utility spot that is not dedicated to something that gives you mobility. Because right here, you're getting no real mobility out of this unless you're diving into people with it, but even that's inconsistent. Almost every single other utility spell, save a few, has a lot of really strong mobility potential if you use it properly. Hunter's Chains doesn't, really. It's a difficult ability to talk about because I genuinely, I stand by this ranking. And it's probably the thing that I thought about the most. In fact, it received a slight hot fix a few days ago. And I actually went back in. I was ready to do this tier list basically like over the weekend. And after the last round of hot fixes went out, which included Hunter's Chains, I played a bunch of games where I specifically looked for this. I had a few matches where I had epic Hunter's Chains at the very end. And I just like, I couldn't really do much with this. Every single time, like, I got some kills with a Hunter's Chains combo, but there were so many others where my opponent would just get away from me at low health, and I'm thinking to myself, if I had literally anything else except maybe Snowdrift right here, I would be able to kill that person. And then a lot of times they run away, they heal up, they come back and attack me, and I'm just fucked. And once somebody knows that you have Hunter's Chains, you can't really do much with it, because, like I said, it's so easy to play around. So... 
a lot of times you're banking on them making a mistake. You know, they don't realize you have it. They try to slice and wins out. You grab them back in. You hit them with a searing axe or something like that. And they're not expecting it. So they're really low. Boom, you get a kill. But there's so many other ways to consistently get kills that don't require, you know, ambushing somebody with the chains that I just can't realistically say that it's a good ability. Long time spent on that, but I figure this is probably going to be my most controversial placement in the tier list. So want to make sure I thoroughly explain it. Now for everything else, I think I'm going to talk about Searing Axe next just because I've mentioned it so much. It is an ability that you will see a lot of people using. So this one's definitely A tier. It's a good ability. I think it's overused by people, but it's hard to say overused because it is strong. The thing about Searing Axe though is I see a lot of people, like the amount of times when I get to a late game situation and I see somebody drop an epic smack roll for a Searing Axe, and I'm just like watching them like, okay, I swoop in there, I pick up their epic smack roll and I proceed to kill them with it. And I think a lot of people just think that smack roll is a worse version of Searing Axe when really it's the other way around. And the main reason for that, I believe, is because Searing Axe does all of its damage front-loaded. It's a really simple ability. You press it, you hit an axe and a cone in your direction, it does a shit ton of damage. Pretty easy, but at the same time, because it is so straightforward, it's also like relatively hard to pull off if your opponent knows what they're doing. Day one of Plunderstorm, I was running around with, what was my combo? I think I had like Holy Shield, Searing Axe, or no, I had Fire Whirl, obviously, because it was kind of broken on day one. But Fire Whirl, Searing Axe, I had Quaking Leap, I had Caltrops and stuff like that. And I was just diving on top of people, pressing Searing Axe, and they were dying. And early on when nobody really knew what the abilities did, and you could just walk up to people, press your Searing Axe button, and kill them, yeah, it's pretty good. But now, if people know that you have Searing Axe, the downside to it is that it has such a short range that like with a build like Slicing Wind Smackerel, Smackerel is something that I think people don't realize with this is it has a really long range, like a deceptively long range. The hitbox is relatively tight, but it is long. So if you keep your distance and you just tag people from a distance, just keep whipping at them and they can't reach you, if you know that they have Searing Axe, they just won't be able to do anything. If you know the distance, right? If you've played enough that you can like keep track of, okay, I'm out of Searing Axe range, let me just spin around, smack roll, and then just keep holding W. And if they try to dive you, well, then you just blink out. Try to dive you again, slicing wins out. Oh, they're trying to reach me, smack roll, keep running. And you can just kite somebody with Searing Axe indefinitely. So realistically, this build kind of needs a like something that works with it. So Searing Axe really wants to have either Slicing Winds or Fire Whirl. Like, I have won a lot of games with Slicing Winds, Searing Axe, and just... I never got Smack Roll, and I just slot in Searing Axe where Smack Roll was, and it works fine, but every single time, I'm always like, man, I wish I had Smack Roll. It would just be so much stronger here. The only reason why I'm not putting Searing Axe in B tier, which, like I said, is more situational, can be good if you have the right setup, is because it is, it's strong on its own. Like, I've mentioned it a lot where if in the early game somebody is Searing Axe, it is one of the most oppressive abilities because when you don't have Steel Traps, Caltrops, uh, Lightning Bulwark, Repel, anything that helps you get away from somebody, if they can just walk up to you and press Searing Axe and do a lot of damage, there's really not a lot that you can do about that. It does a ton. And Smackerel early on is good, but it's much harder to consistently pull off the extra damage because of the longer cooldown. So a lot of times, if you're not directly on top of somebody when the cooldown comes off and you're immediately hitting them with it, you lose the poison effect and you lose your opportunity to do bonus damage. So I would say early game, they're probably similar in terms of how good they are for killing people, but Smackerel really comes online when you get the full kit. It still Searing Axe, I should note, works fantastically with Fade to Shadow because you can get right up in somebody's face and open out of your stealth with Searing Axe and there's not a lot of time for them to react. One of the main issues with Searing Axe is because of that long range, it kind of necessitates other utility spells such as Quaking Leap. Now, I love Quaking Leap. I think it's a really fun ability to use. It was, like I said, day one of Plunderstorm, one of the abilities I was using the most. And in terms of like fun factor for me, I think Quaking Leap is one of my favorites. Slicing Winds I probably enjoy more, but I love this ability. It's really good. If you manage to land it and get the stun off, it, Searing Axe plus Quaking Leap is an amazing combo. 
if you can land it correctly. But that's kind of the hard part. The biggest issue with Quaking Leap, in my opinion, is that World of Warcraft's physics is just so fucked. The amount of times where Quaking Leap literally like teleports me backwards because it just like there's some little rock on the ground that obstructs my pathing and I just get pulled backwards into like a star bomb or something and I get fucked. It has happened to me way too many times. And I know that there's like probably some degree of skill that like if I perfected it, yes, I can nail the Quaking Leaps and never get obstructed by terrain. But I feel like I've gotten really good at this ability and there are still times where I'm like, how did that not send me in the direction I was going? And that really, really limits the usefulness of this ability. Also, the hitbox on the leap is really inconsistent. There are times where you're all the way up in the air and somebody fires a windstorm at where you were like a second ago and it still stuns you up in the air and then you just helplessly fall down as they line up a combo on you. So it can be devastating if you use it properly and if a lot of the like hitbox detection things were fixed i would probably move it further up i still think it's a tier just because of how strong it can be especially early game if you get quaking leap this thing fucks in the early game it's so good it is maybe one of the best utility spells if not the best utility spell to get early on because it does so much damage for a low level spell but i just really struggle to use this in late game matches especially when the storm is really small and you're all in like very confined spaces the movement on it just isn't precise enough to get around and it's very telegraphed right so the advantage of like these mobility spells right of slicing winds is you slicing winds i don't know if i really talked about this enough it's such an amazing ability but you can charge this up, and a lot of times you just bait people because they don't know when you're going to release it. So I will charge up Slicing Wind sometimes, and people immediately Lightning Bulwark, and I just wait out the entire charge. Right as their Lightning Bulwark fades, I release it and hit them, and they lose their thing. Same with Repel, things like that. And also, a lot of times, somebody starts charging up a Repel right as I'm about to finish Slicing Winds and dive on them. Well, you can just change your camera angle. The moment that they start charging Repel, just flick your camera, you slice off in a different direction. And because you have all that charging time to decide how far you're going to go, which direction you're going to go, you have so much control over this ability, which is kind of why I said before, it's really good, but you really need to learn how to use it properly and how to get the most out of this. Once you master Slicing Winds, it'll change Plunderstorm for you. You'll just start winning matches much more consistently. And kind of the same thing about Blink, right? You can just turn your camera any direction, quickly blink. The moment you blink, you're in stealth. There's like a little after image of you left for a moment that somebody can kind of see where you went if they're really paying attention. But a lot of times you can just quickly change course and like blink in one direction, run in the other, bait somebody. They can't detect you well in stealth unless they, you know, hit you with something, which generally speaking, they won't, though I've had it happen. Another thing, I think I overlooked this earlier, but one of the reasons smack roll is so good is it breaks you out of stealth. So if you are in a mirror match where somebody else has Slicing Wind Smack Roll, I've had this a few times. The main thing that I do in a mirror match of Slicing Wind Smack Roll Fade is I make sure that they can't hit me. I just tag them once with Smack Roll and then I blink away. And I make sure that they are constantly poisoned and I try to make sure that they cannot hit me with a poison. Because if you have the Fade to Shadow advantage and every time they try to blink away, they're immediately broken out of stealth. They can never get a good opener on you, and you can just keep picking them with no resistance with Toxic Smack Roll. Very, very, very good. But generally speaking, this is still really nice. Fae Farm, obviously, you just get the movement speed. You can go wherever you want. All that to say, Quaking Leap, when you press this, you are locked into an animation, and you can decide very small things about like exactly how far you land, right? You can leap up and then immediately crash down and just kind of flick yourself forward and land on somebody kind of in melee range, but not quite. Or you can charge up the leap and go really far. So the distance that you're traveling is a little bit variable, but you're on a straight line for the most part. So if somebody knows how to predict roughly where you're going to be in Quaking Leap, it makes it really easy to counterplay that. And somebody could very easily, like, see you quaking leaping, jump over to where you are, like, you know, blink right on top of where you're about to land and charge up a repel, 
or charge up a star bomb right after you quake and leap in like the general direction of where you're going. You can land in that. Now suddenly you've burned one of your mobility options. Whoops. Unless you have fade to shadow or fey form to very quickly get out of that star bomb before it blows up, you've now lost half your health. So it's just a really tricky ability to use. So I can't put it any higher. I'm tempted to put it lower. It's, uh, it's still very useful in a lot of situations. Now, I put Steel Traps here earlier. I didn't really talk about it much. I wanted to at least note that I think that's where it is. It's a good ability. I'm actually going to put Steel Traps and Windstorm both here at the same time. I'm going to put I'm going to put Windstorm low A and Steel Traps there. Um Windstorm is significantly better in duos. So, I think it deserves that. In singles, it's like here. In duos, it's maybe up here, so I'm going to split the difference, put it here, because even in duos, it's very hard to use. Windstorm is the best crowd control ability in the game, if you land it. If you land this, you have, what is it, like 2.5 seconds of just uninterrupted stun time to do whatever you want with your opponent. It is ludicrous. Since we're talking about Steel Traps, I'm going to talk about these abilities next. So Star Bomb and Earthbreaker, because kind of all four of these abilities, they fit together. Really, they're, they're all in the same niche for the most part. Because if you're running Windstorm, now Windstorm, it's more universally useful, right? Because you can use it and then follow up with a Searing Axe. If somebody's stunned, right, you know, they can't really respond to anything. So there's a lot of openings that you can do with Windstorm, especially, like I said, in duos. Because if you're playing with somebody who has, like, Slicing Wind, Smack Roll, and this stuff, and you have, I don't know, Windstorm, Fey Form... Uh, Star Bomb and any other ability, really. Let's say Rhyme Arrow. You're just like kind of the ranged poker. Landing a Windstorm on somebody that your duo's partner is chasing with like this aggressive build, a lot of times that person's just dead. If your duo's partner knows what they're doing and they can just smack roll, melee range, slicing wind, and then by the time it fades, they're ready to go again and you just immediately follow up, that person just gets 100 owed. It's very, 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 very powerful, but obviously very hard to use. The only problem with Windstorm in solos is that it is hard to use in an aggressive setup. So, like this Slicing Wind Smack Roll build, which is, I would say, the king of solos, it does not have room for Windstorm. It needs to have things like Fade to Shadow, Quaking Leap, Fey Form, hell, even Hunter's Chain, though I wouldn't recommend it, only use it if you absolutely need to. And Caltrops, which is a little bit trickier, so I'll talk about that later. You just can't use something that only stuns, right? Because all of your other stuff needs to either be a really good escape tool or something that does both escape and sets up combos. Like Quaking Leap can be used to escape from people in a pinch, but it's also a really good initiation tool. Same with, I guess I'll talk about it here, Caltrops. Caltrops is a really nice ability because it has the slow that drops in the ground where it roots the player, does a tiny bit of damage, slows them, but it can be used as a disengage. I genuinely still to this day barely see anybody using Caltrops effectively where they're like spinning, disengaging, right? Like you do with a hunter in regular World of Warcraft and using it as an escape tool, but it is so good for that. You can also spin towards somebody, right? Dive bomb them with Caltrops and then land right on top of them, send a smack roll right into their face and then blink out. So it's actually a pretty decent replacement for Fae Form. The only reason that I'm not putting it higher is because I do think that it is a little bit weaker than these other options in terms of what it provides. Quaking Leap is a much better tool than Caltrops. In terms of initiation, it's almost strictly better than Caltrops, right? It does the same thing, except it does damage and temporarily stuns the opponent. In terms of getting away from people, Fade to Shadow is universally better, pretty much. There are much better tools for slowing somebody down. The only advantage that Caltrop has is it can kind of do all of them just not quite as good. So it's like a suitable replacement. And the main thing that Caltrops does better than anything else is if you're trying to cross the map really fast, it is probably better than anything except maybe Slicing Winds. Slicing Winds is just god tier for mobility. But Caltrops especially, if you get on like a really high cliff, you jump off the cliff, you press Caltrops, and there's not like enough of a distance below you for it to bounce you, the game just launches you really far. So you can get ridiculous distance in the right positions with Caltrops. And if you're chasing somebody down and you're in terrain like that, 
they can not prepare for that. I've dropped on so many people like that. They completely did not expect it. They thought they were far enough away. Really good for that. Or just, you know, getting out of a storm, getting to a different area so you can farm plunder. Really versatile, really nice. So I personally love using Caltrops, but I do recognize that it's just generally not as good as a lot of these other abilities. But I have won countless games with Caltrops in my build. It is really nice. That's kind of the, the issue right with Windstorm, where if this was purely for solos, I would probably put this up here and I would put Windstorm lower, but I think Windstorm still has enough use case. Now, in defensive builds, which is why I put Starbomb Earthbreaker here, Windstorm is almost mandatory for those builds. One or the other, Windstorm or Steel Traps, they are very, very, very strong. And in order to consistently land Starbomb, especially in solos, you kind of need that. And Starbomb, on that topic, this is something that I initially thought was trash, kind of like Smackerel. Day one, I think on my launch day Plunderstorm livestream, I said, Starbomb is the worst ability in the game, Smackerel is the second worst ability in the game. Well, I was dead wrong about Smackerel, but Starbomb, I wasn't entirely wrong about, but it is, it's better than I thought, right? It did get buffed. The buff did make it significantly stronger. But I still think Starbomb is pretty good. And I think enough people I've seen now running Starbomb focused builds, it seems to be like a fan favorite. And I do like playing with it. The only problem with Starbomb is it kind of forces you into one very particular setup. If you get Starbomb, you are not going to land a hit unless you have stuff to work around it. It is like the quintessential B tier ability. If you do get Steel Traps, right, and somebody doesn't have Fae Form, that's kind of the problem, right? Fae Form negates Starbomb entirely. It negates Hunter's Chains, it negates Windstorm, it negates Starbomb, Hunter's tra or Steel Traps, right? This ability just destroys everything. I really want to put it in S tier, but I still think these are a cut above. But if somebody doesn't have Fae Form and they hop into a Steel Trap, especially early game, right? You drop Starbomb on them, there's fucking nothing they can do. It is one of the strongest abilities in like the first half of the game if you manage to get either a Windstorm or a Steel Traps to combo with it. The amount of times where I've landed and gotten these two, it's not high, but when it does, I almost always go on a rampage because people just keep diving me, drop traps, drop star bomb, they're gone. It's really satisfying to use. And if somebody else has it, it feels really unfair because until you have stuff like Fae Form, there's not really a lot you could do to counter it. But if somebody doesn't have that, well, you just kind of hold W and walk out of their star bomb, and that's it. The thing about Steel Traps and Windstorm is I have played a lot of star bomb games where I try to run both. And the problem with that is that if you are against somebody who doesn't have Fae Form, then you completely destroy them with both Steel Traps and Windstorm they will basically have no counterplay, and it feels broken. The only problem with this is getting to a position where you are 1v1-ing somebody without Fey Form with this build is ludicrously hard, not just because most people will have Fey Form that late in the game, but also because surviving that late into the game using a combination of these two abilities is really difficult because they offer you basically nothing. And that is one thing that I've consistently noticed. A lot of times when I run into people in the final five or so that have this setup you know windstorm steel trap star bomb they are like level six level six or seven while i am level 10 because they have no mobility you know you're running star bomb it has no mobility as an attack most attacks don't have a ton of mobility but you're also running two utility spells that have literally zero mobility attached to them so the only way that you're getting from point A to point B is by holding W and slowly walking there. Or if you happen to find barrels or mechano hogs or something, maybe if you're lucky. But realistically speaking, your travel time is awful. So you really can't farm plunder efficiently at all. So the only way to reliably get that build is to farm a lot of plunder early on and keep something like Caltrops in your back pocket for most of the game so that you have something that you can combo with Starbomb, right? Like Caltrops into Starbomb, it's not the best combo, but it can work. And the advantage of that is Caltrops also lets you get that mobility. It lets you escape. Because one of the other problems, right, is somebody does have Fae Form and you have Windstorm and Steel Traps, you are fucked. You cannot stop them. But if you have Caltrops, well, maybe you can get some distance. If you have another spell, you can play around it. Like, a lot of times, if I'm running Searing Axe Starbomb and my opponent has Fae Form, 
all right, well, I can't reliably hit them with Star Bomb, but maybe if I have Caltrops, I can try to kite them, chip away at them with Searing Axe, and hope that if they're not good at landing whatever abilities they have, I can get a Searing Axe only kill and just not rely on Star Bomb at all. But that's the problem. It is really inconsistent. I, I should note, of course, this is mostly a duo's build. I have not seen too many people have success with the whole Star Bomb setup in solos. I've gotten like a few wins with it, but I've also gotten infinitely more final five finishes where I just get destroyed by somebody that has better stuff. And I just find myself unable to really respond to what they're doing to me, because if they don't step into my Star Bomb, I just die. Though, I do think it belongs here because I have one with it, right? It is a possible build that you can win with, unlike Storm Archon, which I just do not think that you are able to take a seat at the table at all if you have this against any sort of competent opponent. So it's just not good. And I think that kind of covers most of why I think these abilities belong where they are. I'm tempted to move Windstorm down, but like I said, it does have really good potential if you're in a good duos game and you set that up. But I would imagine most people watching this are probably more focused on solo matches or they're just getting into the game and they're, you know, learning with a duos partner and... As a result, you know, they're not going to be able to pull off Windstorm combos, so it won't be super reliable. So you may tend to find that Steel Traps is a bit more consistent for you, because if you miss your Windstorm, you're kind of fucked. Whereas Steel Traps, if you don't immediately land it, you can still use it as a defensive option if your opponent doesn't have a form. And in the early game, they may not. And then you can use it kind of as an escape tool, just block off a giant section of area and kind of play around it, walk around it, and then when they're on the opposite side, book it in the opposite direction. And if they try to dive you, do it again. And maybe they'll accidentally step into it and you can spin around and hit them with a, a Star Bomb. Now, I kind of casually tossed Earthbreaker here, and Earthbreaker, if this was last week, would be down here. It was one of the worst abilities in the game. I would honestly say it was probably worse than Storm Archon before the changes. Now, recently they changed it so it has a slightly larger hitbox, which does actually massively buff its viability because Earthbreaker was way too easy to walk out of before. Now I would say it's about as difficult to escape as Star Bomb, which is to say not very on its own, but if you have some sort of slow and you manage to hit it, you can fairly consistently get a hit with Earthbreaker. The one problem with Earth Earthbreaker, no, actually, the two problems with it, is that it's it's less devastating than Star Bomb, really. It does have, like, kind of a knock-up effect, but Star Bomb also drags the opponent towards you. One of the reasons I really like the aforementioned Searing Axe Star Bomb combo is if you drag your opponent into the Star Bomb and they're pulled towards you, you can run up towards the middle really quick and charge up a Searing Axe to land right as they get dragged to the center. And that is devastating. That will, like, eat away at most people's health, 90% of it. Really, really, really strong. Usually not enough for a one-shot kill, which is kind of why it's not as good as it could be. If that was a guaranteed one-hit KO, maybe that would be a really devastating combo, but it usually leaves them at, like, 10 to 20%. So if they can escape, then you're just sitting around waiting for them to fall for it again, which doesn't always happen. And Earthbreaker kind of has a similar issue, except you're casting like the entire time you can kind of follow it up with searing axe but it doesn't do as much damage so in many cases it becomes a star bomb that does less damage and is harder to hit because it's centered around you so the thing about you know windstorm right is if somebody's trying to like reach you they're like darting in and they're like basically kiting you from range with toxic smackerel and they're like a little bit distance away well, you can shoot out a Windstorm, catch them off guard really quickly, and then charge up a Star Bomb immediately, and because the radius is so big, you'll be able to consistently hit them if you land that one-two punch, because it goes, like, pretty far out in front of you. But Earthbreaker is right around you, so even if you land that Windstorm, you then need to run up to the person, then start casting it, and then the radius is going to be, like, on the edge of them, and if their stun breaks in time, they just walk out of it. Or, if they have, like, Fade to Shadow and they're really good at it, they can like mash this and then the moment their stun fades, blink right out of Earthbreaker. You could technically do that with Star Bomb too, but the timing is a little bit harder. Definitely nowhere near as lenient as Earthbreaker. A lot of times it really does just feel like a worse Star Bomb. The only advantage to Earthbreaker and the reason why I'm not putting it in D tier is because it is a better defensive option than Star Bomb. 
If somebody is diving you, it can be hard to consistently land Star Bomb, even if you have this stuff. Like, if somebody has Fae Form, right? You're not really going to be able to reliably land Star Bomb on them because they ne can negate all of your CCs. But if somebody has Fae Form, you could realistically hit them with an Earthbreaker if they're hard diving you by timing it right, because they're going to be right on top of you and you'll be able to kind of combo into other stuff. So I would say Earthbreaker is not an ability that you really want to use with the traditional like CC setup. You don't want to really use this as something that wants to like do a lot of damage to the opponent. You want to have a main damage dealer, maybe Smack Girl, Searing Axe, etc. And then if they try to counterattack, you can hit them with the Earthbreaker and then continue your attack, whatever it is. Like Fiery Whirl is... Uh, a good one to use with this. You may notice I haven't talked about this yet or ranked it, and that's maybe because I want to make sure people don't rip my head off for where I'm going to put it. But I think that Earthbreaker previously was really bad and, and still kind of is because it is so easy to just counterattack somebody with Earthbreaker. It's kind of the Storm Archon problem where you're just kind of sitting there. You're a sitting duck. And while you're casting Earthbreaker, everybody immediately knows where you're going to end up when you're done with it, right? So a lot of times, Somebody starts doing Earthbreaker, I run just outside their circle, I start charging up a Slicing Wind. The moment it goes off, I slice through them. What are they going to do? They're stuck in the cast. You can't cancel the cast, right? And I know exactly where they're going to be. They're not moving. They're pretty stationary. So it's just way too easy to follow up on an Earthbreaker. And the only reason why this is not going into the D tier is because last week they made it so, in addition to the range changes, while you are charging up Earthbreaker, you are immune to all forms of crowd control. So another classic combo used to be, somebody's charging up Earthbreaker? Well, okay then. You're a sitting duck, I'm going to hit you with my Windstorm, you're now stunned, and I'm going to drop my Star Bomb on top of you. What are you going to do about it? So in that case, it was a strictly worse Star Bomb. Star Bomb still kind of has that problem, but at least, you know, you're not completely locked in place. You know, it's a little bit away from you, so it's harder to consistently land that. Usually if you're playing Star Bomb, you're playing with like Steel Traps anyways. So eh. still Star Bomb is susceptible to it, but it has more use cases, like I said. But Earthbreaker before, it was just way too easy to line that up, right? And it had nothing else going for it. Now, because you are immune to CC, that is one thing that it does marginally better than Star Bomb, right? You, you can charge it up and know that you will not be stunned, which would be good, Right, that would be a useful thing to have if it wasn't for the fact that it's it's just kind of worse than a utility spell, namely repel. Where do I want to put repel? I think I'm gonna put repel here. Repel is definitely A tier. It is spoiler alert the final ability that I'm putting in A tier. It's good. Uh, it is, in my opinion, just better than Earthbreaker. Obviously, you can't compare them one to one because Earthbreaker is an attack, while as repel is a defensive utility spell. But I would say, why waste your attack slot for something that is just worse than Repel when you can just take Repel and it kind of does the same thing. The only thing that Repel doesn't do is A, it now has a notably smaller area that it covers. Before, Repel was almost exactly the same size as Earthbreaker, which was kind of hilarious. It was about as easy to hit. It was still a little bit smaller. But now Earthbreaker is like, it is roughly twice the area that it covers. So it's a little bit easier to hit if you are trying to use it as like a follow-up tool. But generally speaking, one of that the issues with Earthbreaker is that if you're using it as a way to follow up with other attacks, well, now you only have one other attack to follow up with. And that's kind of where Repel comes in. Now, Repel is interesting because it doesn't have any sort of mobility tied to it. And as I've mentioned before, a lot of my favorite utility spells that I think are the strongest have heavy mobility because... Being able to cross the map really quickly, being able to farm plunder efficiently and get higher levels, it's really good. Repel doesn't do that. And it's still strong. I, I think it deserves to be here, right? I'm debating, do I put it above Searing Axe? I think Searing Axe, because a lot of the builds that run Repel also want to run Searing Axe. Because Repel is really nice as like a way to get away from somebody. Not necessarily get away from somebody, but stop a dive. So... If somebody is running like the smack roll uh, slicing winds build and they jump right on top of you and you hit them with a repel, not only are you immune, which is the biggest thing, that's what makes it so strong, completely immune to damage, but you can stun them and then follow up into your own combo. So 
I think in many cases, Repel, it's a good defensive option, but it's not even necessarily the best defensive option. Like, if you're just trying to get away from people, Fade to Shadow is better, uh, Fae Form is better, even Caltrops is better. Repel is actually best used in not Slicing Winds builds, which is why I won't put it as high, because, like, you don't really need it in Slicing Winds. But if you don't have Slicing Winds, it's really nice as a way to deny your opponent's damage. So if I have, like, Smack Roll, Fade, Repel, and, I don't know, Searing Axe or something, or um, even a Rhyme Arrow setup, and I dive them and I hit them with my Smack Roll, and they're about to go hit me with theirs when I'm right on top of them, I hit Repel, I negate their Smack Roll, I stun them, and then I immediately follow up with my next set of abilities. So you can use it aggressively, just pop it in an opponent's face, negate their burst window, stun them, and then continue. And it, it still can be used defensively. I think the best thing is that it shuts down Star Bomb, it shuts down Earthbreaker, because if somebody pops this on you, you don't even need to run. You can just run closer to them inside their Star Bomb. Right as it's about to go off, press your repel. You are immune to the damage, and then you stun them and they can't move. Right? So that's kind of one of the issues with Earthbreaker, right? Well, if somebody else has Earthbreaker, if it's Earthbreaker versus Earthbreaker, you may be immune to knockback if you eat somebody's Earthbreaker to the face, but you're still going to take damage, and you may hit them with it after, but now they've gotten the damage first, and you're only doing it after. Doesn't really even out. Repel, not only are you negating that Earthbreaker's damage, but you're following up with your own, and you're stunning them, and you're allowing yourself to follow through, and the opponent just blasted one of their attack spells and got nothing out of it. So... It is relatively versatile, but I think it still is not as strong as some of the other options just because it doesn't have any of the mobility attached to it. And that's good, for the record. I think that Repel is actually extremely balanced. It's uh, it's really good. I like it. Um, I don't think it needs any tuning whatsoever. It's perfect the way it is, and that's fine. Not everything should be up here. Like, these three abilities need to be nerfed. Even Fae Form, I'd say, needs to be nerfed. I think Rhyme Arrow needs to be reworked. Searing Axe, uh, Repel, these are maybe two of the best tuned abilities in the game. Quaking Leap would be good if it wasn't buggy half the time. And like, you know, Windstorm's good, right? But hard to use. And in my opinion, one of the other abilities that I think is really well tuned and doesn't really need a buff or a nerf is Manosphere. And I'm going to put it here. B tier. Manosphere is... It's not amazing, but it's not bad. It's one of those abilities where I'm never unhappy to see it, but I'll usually replace it later in the game. I think a lot of people also use it wrong. I see so many people charging up like a gigantic Manosphere, and that can work. I, it's better if you're in a duos, right? It's kind of the similar thing to Storm Archon, where I said, well, Storm Archon is better in duos. There's so many other things that are also better in duos, like CC Chains, or pinging with Rhyme Arrow while your opponent dies, or Manosphere. Manosphere is... Pretty good in duos. I wouldn't necessarily say it's so good that it deserves to be higher up, but you can reliably sit back and charge up a big Manosphere while your duo's partner keeps somebody busy and just lob it at the person they're attacking. So if they get somebody low and then a gigantic Manosphere comes out of nowhere and just finishes them off, it's pretty good. But generally speaking, unless you are in like the very final stages of the storm, a gigantic Manosphere is not easy to hit. Like, if somebody's diving you, they can just quickly juke it unless you clip them with, like, the gigantic hitbox as they're going behind you, which happens. But it also just doesn't do really enough damage to justify, like, fully charging it up. So, generally speaking, the best case I find for Manosphere is just lobbing it at the small size. You get kind of close to medium range to somebody, you try to predict where they're going, you lob a really quick Manosphere targeted like at them if it hits them it does a decent amount of damage and stops them cold and you can run in because like they get bounced in the opposite direction so it does enough solid damage that it's competitive with a lot of the other low level abilities it's good for mob farming it's just a pretty versatile spell i like i said i think it is very well balanced it has good defensive options because if somebody is charging you right a lot of times if i fully charge that manosphere they're not going to or they're going to be able to dodge it but if I start charging it and then really quickly, right early on, I flick it in their direction, people expect me to charge it up longer, so I'm able to easily hit somebody as they're diving me and bounce them backwards. And then I have time to run back, set up, you know, whatever attack that I want to do. So it's just, it's good. 
I honestly don't really have much else to say about it. It's not a super impressive ability. Admittedly, it's not one of my favorites. It's one that I don't play with a lot. But early on, I remember not loving Mana Sphere, and it's grown on me, especially early game. I've gotten a lot of really good kills with it, like in the first five minutes of the match where I get it as my first thing. And I've been able to make more plays with it than I have with a lot of the other things on this list. So it has my respect as an ability. And like I said, better in duos than it is in solos. Anything like that that has like a CC or ranged component to it makes it better for duos because, you know, solos is just dive, dive, dive in 90% of cases, but I still think it has its place. I've seen people running with it in solos matches. I think it's another really good counterpart to like Starbomb builds. So if you don't have anything else, I still think Searing Axe is probably the best thing to go along with Starbomb uh, or like Smackerel, right? These two are really good with it. But if you don't have that, Mana Sphere is not a bad one to use. It can give you some good distance and that way you can run something like Fae Form, like Fade to Shadow, and it gives you more ways to crowd control an opponent without having to take up a utility slot. So kind of nice to have. Now we're down to the final three. Uh, you know, I'm going to leave Fire World for last. I think that would be a funny thing to do because I know so many people really want to see me rank Fire World. And initially, I did not intend to leave it to last. It's just it's such a difficult ability to talk about because of the community perception of it. So now I'm just going to do it out of spite. You know, fuck you. <laughs> I'm leaving Firewall to last. But uh, Lightning Bulwark, I think, is a good one to talk about next. Um, I'm going to put it top of B tier. I don't think it deserves to be A. Lightning Bulwark, in my opinion, is a slightly worse Repel that is situationally better than Repel. I think for defensive builds, Lightning Bulwark is significantly worse. And I actually, I do not think this is good for defense in most cases, it can be used in a pinch, right? So that's why it's not like lower on B tier. It's a flexible ability. Uh, previously, it got sizable buffs last week along with some of those other spells. I would have put it in C tier before, um, but it got much, much, much better. And the main thing that it improved is it's now a very good component in a dive build like Slicing Winds. I still don't love it, because, like, the way that you would need to use it is you would need to replace either Fade to Shadow or Fae Form with it in a dive build. And both of those fulfill a niche that Lightning Bulwark just doesn't. It's It can kind of replace Fae Form in certain situations, right? Because if you time it correctly and somebody hits you with, say, a Windstorm, well, now you negate the Windstorm and you gain movement speed so you can quickly follow up and attack the person. But... It's kind of like, you know, the thing I said earlier about Fey Form needing to not be usable while stunned. Well, you can't use Lightning Bulwark after you've already been stunned. So if you don't time it properly, it's worthless. Uh, I think Fey Form should get that treatment. And mind you, while Fey Form would drop down considerably, it would still be good. It would have its own niche because it would still give you immunity and increased movement speed. So it would be better first for crossing the map, even if it was nerfed, but it would still be really good at opening on people even if they don't trigger Lightning Bulwark because that's kind of the problem with it. Lightning Bulwark, if somebody hits it, right, if you press this as a star bomb's going off or you negate a Windstorm with this, which I think is the most common use generally, if I get Lightning Bulwark, I'm usually hoping that they try to Windstorm me and then immediately follow up and they have nothing. Or like Repel, they drop a Repel on you and you negate it because it does do a little bit of damage so it triggers Lightning Bulwark. That's the dream for it and... Usually, I don't try to pop Lightning Bulwark early. A lot of people make the mistake of the moment they see me about to attack them, they press Lightning Bulwark preemptively before I've even used any abilities. And that does two things. One, I'm not going to open on them, right? If I see them sitting there in Lightning Bulwark, I'm just going to sit there and wait it out. I'm in no rush. As I said before, if they're charging it up, I just charge up Slicing Winds, and the moment that it fades, I slice through them. Boom. But also, now I know that they have Lightning Bulwark. So now I'm constantly watching for it. And I know, like, my smack rolls off cooldown. They probably know if they're good that my smack rolls off cooldown. We're going to see the Lightning Bulwark coming out. And then I see it come out. I play back a little bit. The moment it fades, hit them with the smack roll. So Lightning Bulwark is a little bit tricky because once somebody knows that you have it, it's much harder to make plays with it. It's really good as a surprise tool of, you know, somebody drops a star bomb on you, surprise, you didn't know I had lightning bulwark, now the tables have turned. But once they've realized that, it's much more limited in its usefulness. So 
For new players, for people who are like relatively inexperienced, it's like down here. It's really hard to use properly. Much harder than Repel, because Repel, it's just you press it, you're immune, you knock back people. Really simple. Lightning Bulwark, you have to get the timing down really well. And once somebody knows about it, they can just wait it out. Repel, at least you are immune and you create space, right? That's another big one. If somebody is directly on top of you, Repel will stun them. So they need to back up. They need to stay away from Repel. And you can hold W in their direction a little bit slowly while channeling Repel to keep building that space, forcing them backwards. So the moment Repel ends, they're not able to immediately open on you. But there are times where somebody's channeling Lightning Bulwark. I'm just sitting literally on top of them, ready to hit them with a Searing Axe, a Smack Roll. The moment it fades, it's the Earthbreaker problem. It's the, the Star Bomb problem, that thing, where you know exactly where they're going to be, Storm Archon, they're rooted in place effectively, and you can just play around that and completely destroy them the moment it fades. So, it's tricky to use, it's not bad. Uh, this is, like I've mentioned before, after last week's hotfixes, I played a bunch of games to test out a lot of the changes, namely the changes to Bulwark, Hunter's Chains, uh, Earthbreaker, those are the big ones. There were some other slight changes, but like, you know, the nerf to Fae form, if anything, just maybe bump it down slightly. I gained a little bit more respect for Earthbreaker, but the main one that I gained respect for was Lightning Bulwark. I thought this was worthless. Uh, early on, I was saying that it was just strictly worse repel, and I think day one it probably was strictly worse repel. But now that it has like an increased movement speed, it, it is better than repel in aggressive builds. The only problem is, like I said before, you just can't really justify replacing either Fade, Fae Form, or Quaking Leap for Lightning Bulwark, really. It's too easy to play around, and generally speaking, if you're in the mirror match, and your opponent has this setup, or this setup, and you have Lightning Bulwark, you're going to lose. It's basically a way to tailor this dive build to deal with stuff like Starbomb, stuff like Windstorm, and it is very good in that 1v1, right? Like the aforementioned thing where I said, if you have Windstorm Steel Traps and somebody's playing Slicing Winds, you fuck them up. Well, if they're playing Slicing Winds with Lightning Bulwark, suddenly the inverse is true. They fuck you up. But it, it's really only good as a counter to your hardest counter, so... Eh. It, it's one of those things where, if anything, if you reach, like, the final five, and you notice a lot of people are playing like this, and you're thinking, hmm, I have maybe Fade to Shadow Quaking Leap, and I've been using Quaking Leap as a way to dive somebody and get like these really big Searing Axes off or, or Toxic Smack Rolls off, but I'm probably not going to be able to reliably dive people if they have Traps or Windstorm. They're just going to line it up and counter me, and maybe I see a level one Lightning Bulwark on the ground, and sometimes that judgment call of, I'm going to drop my rank four Quaking Leap and pick up this level one Lightning Bulwark because it's just better against those types of builds, that's the kind of situation where this thing can really shine. I haven't really encountered that yet, but I've had some situations where, like mid-game, I see a lightning bulwark on the ground and somebody with Star Bomb has been hounding me. So I pick this up, run over to them, they don't realize that I swap utility spells, and I just destroy them with it. So I've gained a lot of respect for this ability. I've also seen a lot of people make good use of this. I still do not think it deserves to be an A tier. It's still not quite on the level of these other things. Now, Holy Shield, I'm going to put at the top of C tier. Um, this is probably another one that I think a lot of people are going to be upset about, similar to the Hunter's Chains one, because I know this is a lot of people's favorite ability. And I really like the design of Holy Shield. I think the, the general way that it plays, right? I mean, you fire it off, you activate it, it explodes. Everything about that, check, check, check. Seems like a cool attack. It seems like it should be good, right? It's, it's a ranged attack. We don't have a lot of those but it gives you some flexibility, right? Where Storm Archon, you have to sit there and fire it off. Holy Shield, you can fire and then keep moving while it's going and, you know, activate it from a distance. Much more flexible than Storm Archon. The problem is it just doesn't do damage. It does no fucking damage. I, I don't really understand why this hasn't been buffed. It just, it hits like a wet noodle. I've had people hounding me, consistently exploding their Holy Shield on me, and I'm just able to constantly get a heal off, survive and just keep running away and it just doesn't do damage i i don't know it, it feels honestly like outside of rhyme arrow which the advantage of rhyme arrow is that it's very easy to poke so this is kind of in some ways early game a suitable replacement for rhyme arrow you know if somebody's trying to get away from you you can lob this and poke but if you are familiar with holy shield and you've played the game enough it's pretty easy to dodge it 
at least at long range. Rhyme Arrow, you can't, which is why it is so oppressive. If you are targeted, they will do damage to you. Holy Shield, it's like Rhyme Arrow, but somebody can just walk out of it. And that would be fine if it worked like every other ability in the game, where if somebody did connect with it, it did a lot of damage. Searing Axe is relatively hard to land unless you actually dive into somebody, but when you land, bam, there's damage. Same with Smack Roll, Slicing Winds. I mean, hell, even Earthbreaker does more damage, though of course it has the mobility issues. Manosphere does more damage. You know, fire at close range does a you know, big tick. They're, they're all good. Holy Shield just doesn't hit hard enough. So I really hope that they buff the damage of Holy Shield at some point because I want to use this ability more often. I love the design of it. I think it's really fun. It was one of my most used abilities day one of Plunderstorm. I constantly, I think I even said early on, Holy Shield seems like it's going to be my favorite ability. And I still like it. It just... Damage isn't there. You just cannot reliably kill people with it. I'm putting it at C tier just above Earthbreaker because I think it at least has a little bit more flexibility. Like if you have this with anything else, it's at least a little bit of chip damage. But in many cases, it just feels like a worse Rhyme Arrow. And I'd rather have anything else but Holy Shield except for Earthbreaker because at least Earthbreaker, you know, Holy Shield's not going to get me killed. Earthbreaker and Storm Archon, if I sit there trying to utilize them, I'm just going to get killed because I'm just a sitting duck. And now, Fire Whirl. So, I've mentioned Fire Whirl in passing a few times, and I want to say that day one, it was obviously the most used ability and very oppressive, and everybody thought it was overpowered. And it was overpowered, but after playing with it for like 48 hours before the first set of tuning, I actually did not think it was nearly as overpowered as people thought it was. Namely because while you are fire whirling, you are super susceptible to all forms of crowd control. I started using Star Bomb a lot, like after the first 24 hours, because I realized that so many people were just getting fire whirl and thinking they were God. They would just press fire whirl, charge into me, I would press steel traps, press Star Bomb, and they're dead. And now suddenly I have fire whirl, and I have Star Bomb, and now I can do traps, Star Bomb, Fire Whirl, theirs is expired, they've just gotten to 50% from Star Bomb, and now I'm Fire Whirling on top of them, and they are dead now. And that combo was really nice as a way to completely shut down Fire Whirl, but even then, like if you had mobility spells, like if you had Repel, somebody drops on top of you with Fire Whirl, Repel, boom, they get stunned. One of the things that I would do a lot with Fire Whirl in those early days is I would run on top of somebody, and the moment I stepped on top of them, I would immediately flick my camera, because a lot of times you would instantly bait out a repel, get just out of range of it in your fire swirl because, you know, it had really fast movement speed. It would go off and then you would run back in with the last few ticks and follow up with whatever else you had and they missed their repel. So when fire swirl had really good movement speed, you could still play around it. And I think that movement was what made it so good for two reasons. One, fire whirl was like on par with slicing winds as a mobility option you could cross the map really quickly. It's still good for that. If I get an early Fire Whirl, I'm able to very quickly cross the map, even with like Slicing Winds, it combos perfectly, and you're just farming a ton of plunder, you round up mobs, you press Fire Whirl, does a lot of AoE damage. So it's good for that still, but it's not ludicrously overpowered. Slicing Winds now clearly has that locked down, along with, you know, utility spells like Fae Form, Quaking Leap, Caltrops, etc. So it's no longer a really good advantage of Fire Whirl. It's just a nice bonus. It gives you a slight movement speed increase. Okay, it's it's fine. And one of the things about that movement speed increase, in addition to the map movement, is that it just made it such a good disengaging tool. So there were so many times where I would have like a Searing Axe Fire Whirl build in the first few days, and I was barely even using Fire Whirl as a damage option because so many people would only rely on Fire Whirl to get kills. So I would just, when they Fire Whirl me, I would wait a few seconds, press mine, stay barely outside the range, then right as theirs ended, run in, get the last few ticks, and then Searing Axe for most of my damage. And now they've lost all their bursts, they probably don't even know how to use whatever other attack ability they have, and now if they try to Fire Whirl again, I just press mine at the same time, and they have lower health, so they die. And being able to use it as a disengaging tool against a lot of other stuff, Searing Axe, you know, hell, even Slicing Wind, Smack Roll, you could just get away from all of it with previous Fire Whirl, and nobody could really escape you. This is still kind of an issue in the early game. If you drop, somebody gets Fire Whirl, and you have absolutely nothing, 
there's really not a lot you can do if somebody just presses fire whirl and runs on top of you and just keeps chasing you and you don't get any other abilities. I've had that happen. It, it sucks. There's not much you can do about it. It is maybe the most oppressive ability for somebody to get at level one. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. But in the late game, it's not really that good. It's not bad, but there are so many things that do more damage than Fire Whirl now. And I'm going to be honest, I actually think it got over nerfed. I'm maybe the only person I know saying this. I think that Fire Whirl got over nerfed. I think that the movement speed reduction was fine. That already made it significantly weaker, probably low A tier. And the damage nerf to Fire Whirl, I don't want to say it's killed its viability because it's still a, an okay option, but... Ooh. Where do I put it? It's not C tier, I'll tell you that much. It, it is... It does damage. It's not, like, on the level of these. These are just really hard to use. They don't really do as much. It's... I'm gonna put it here. I... It's... I think it's B tier. I don't think it deserves to be the top of B tier. It, like, anywhere around this you could justify for, but I've gained a lot more respect for Lightning Bulwark, and I've, like, I've run into more people in the final five who are using Lightning Bulwark properly, where, like, I'm charging up Slicing Winds, and as I'm in midair, they press Lightning Bulwark, and I'm like, oh, fuck, and then suddenly they have the speed boost, and I'm like, damn, that, that guy's good. Like, I did not expect that, right? And then suddenly I'm on, like, the back foot, and they're chasing me down, and I have to run and kite with Toxic Smack Roll and try to set up another Slicing Wind while they're hounding me, and now suddenly I'm playing around Lightning Bulwark, and, like, once you get a feel for it, you can bait it out, but I've gotten more trouble lately from this ability than I have with Fire Whirl, because Fire Whirl, like, with... The God Comp, with Slicing Winds, with Fade to Shadow, they cannot catch you. Nobody can catch me with Fire Whirl. And there's a lot of times where somebody is on top of me with Fire Whirl, and I just sit there, I smack roll them, and I just auto-attack them. I'm auto-attacking them while they're Fire Whirling me, while they're ticking down from Poison. And, I mean, you're channeling Fire Whirl, you can't do anything else while you're using it. And it just doesn't do enough damage in many cases to justify running out of it, especially if I'm at the advantage, right? Before, you had to respect it when it had the damage, right? Like, if I was at 100 and I just sat there inside the full duration of someone's fire world, I was going to come out of that with, like, 20% health. And I would now be in a position where they could follow up with a kill. But if I am against somebody who's at, like, 50% and they press fire world on me... And I'm at 100% and I've hit them with a smack roll. A lot of times I know that I can just keep auto attacking them standing in their fire world and it just won't do enough. I don't even need to run away. And then the moment I get that second smack roll off on them, then I run away. After their fire roll's gone, I heal up a little bit and suddenly they have nothing and I blink onto them, hit them with the final smack roll, and they're dead. So there's just not really a whole lot you can do with fire roll. I. Honestly, I think it's really not good in the end game. Like for end game matches, I maybe maybe that's a little bit unfair. I put it down here. The main reason it's even this high up in B tier is because it's still very good in the early game. Like I said, it is maybe the most oppressive ability to get at level one, but that's only if you're trying to kill players. And the thing about that is you don't really want to be killing players in the early game. So it's going to feel bad when you get that one asshole who gets Fire Whirl and just chases you down to the ends of the earth, like right after you land. But the thing about that is if that happens, you just, you quit the game. It only just started, just go again, right? Bad luck, it happens, try again. Realistically speaking, if you get Fire Whirl at level one and there's somebody else there, you should not be chasing them down and trying to kill them with Fire Whirl. You should use Fire Whirl once, basically tell them, hey, Get the fuck out of here, right? They're going to run away because they know they can't fight you. And then just go about your merry business, killing mobs, farming plunder. And it's still good. It still lets you round up a bunch of mobs, fire whirl, and it's a great deterrence tool. If anybody tries to attack you there, you press fire whirl and they fuck off, right? So the main advantage of it early game is that it allows you to very easily farm plunder because nobody else can really fight with you. So you just walk up to an elite and say, this is mine now. I will be taking that plunder. Please leave me alone. But there's a lot of other abilities that also do that. Star Bomb is pretty nice in the early game. I really like getting this as my first one. Uh, it's rough when I immediately hit somebody else who has something like Fire Whirl, but if I can get Star Bomb and I can get basically anything else to work along with it, I really like that type of start. Hell, even Caltrops, if somebody has Fire Whirl, just Caltrops in their face and they're 
slowed. They won't be able to catch you. So the moment that people start getting really any utility spell in the game whatsoever, hell, even Snowdrift, right? One of the nice things about Snowdrift is if you're chasing somebody with Fire World and they pop Snowdrift, they're going to be slowing you and dealing damage and you're going to maybe get like a few ticks off of them, but then they'll just keep running away. So it kind of shuts you down, but you're hard countered by so many abilities. It's just way too easily exploitable. And like I said, I don't even think it was that OP early on. I think a lot of people just didn't understand how to use the utility abilities. And as a result, they got farmed by Fire Whirl and they said it was OP. And you know what? I was one of the people saying I thought it needed a nerf until I kept playing. And I realized, actually, it's really not that strong. Moral of the story, these abilities are broken and desperately need a nerf. These abilities are really good. Some of them can use adjustments, either nerfs or fixes. And this stuff is good. I think, like, honestly, while I said Lightning Bulwark isn't amazing, it's still really well tuned. Like, I don't think this ability needs any changes whatsoever. It is perfect for its niche. I, <laughs> I think Fire World probably is good where it is just because I understand that it is... Like, the argument that I've heard whenever I tell people my opinion on Fire World, and, like, a lot of people agree with me, mind you. Um, I'm not the only one saying that Fire World is not really that good. But the argument that I consistently hear is that, well, for new players, it's really good because you just press it and it does damage for you. You don't need to aim Searing Axe or Smack Earl or Slicing Winds. Like, Slicing Winds really strong, but notoriously difficult for new players to use. I've talked to a lot of people in my Discord who I've been singing the praises of Slicing Winds for two weeks now, and a lot of people have told me, man, I keep trying to use that Slicing Winds build you recommended, and it's just so hard, I can't consistently hit people with it, and I get that. You know, it, it is a really tricky ability to use. It definitely has a high skill ceiling, but it definitely is worth the top spot. But Fire Whirl, I can understand. If you're just going for plunder farming and you don't really care about min-maxing your, your build and trying to kill things as quickly as possible, yeah, go for that. But realistically speaking, I think if you're just trying to complete your quest, you don't even really need Fire Roll. You're probably better off using something like Searing Axe, Star Bomb, Caltrops Quaking Leap. Is a, in my opinion, really good plunder farming builds. You know, anything like that, hell, Fey Form is like a replacement for one of those two. Basically, if all you care about is killing mobs, getting reputation, what you want is utility spells like this, this stuff that gives you heavy mobility and ways to escape from people. That way nobody can just catch up to you and anything that does good damage but also is kind of a deterrent right so star bomb's great because it kills a lot of people kills a lot of elites and people don't really want to fuck with you when you have star bomb because they're just really concerned about stepping into it they know that you won't be able to catch them but that's fine throw this in a doorway and then run the other direction a lot of people just won't follow you because they're just concerned about what if i do get hit then suddenly my game is over so i don't know i just don't think fire world is really that useful and I would put it lower for my own personal preference. Like, I drop Fire Whirl a lot these days. Uh, the only reason I'm putting it here is because I probably would pick it above all of these other attacks. Just because I'm usually looking to build into this. And Fire Whirl is at least a suitable combo with Smack Roll or Slicing Winds. Whereas, like, this stuff is just more for, like, a defensive play style that just doesn't really suit me. But... I would argue that later in the game, with the right setup, both Manosphere and Star Bomb are considerably better than Fire Whirl, if you know how to use them. But I think that's it. Uh, I really hope they buff Storm Archon or do something with it, because it does feel a little bit weird creating a tier just for Storm Archon, but I do think it's necessary. I do think it is just significantly worse than everything else. But honestly, I really, really have to commend Blizzard for the tuning that they've done in here. I think overall it was pretty balanced on launch, but it has now gotten even more balanced. And with the exception of those three abilities on top and that one ability on the bottom, I think everything is pretty good and they've been really responsive. And more importantly, they've done a pretty good job at identifying the problems with a lot of the abilities and buffing them in the correct way, like nerfing Fire World's movement speed or buffing the duration that you could channel Lightning Bulwark, stuff like that, uh, nerfing the damage reduction on Fae Form things of that nature, and I really hope that continues with their nerfs to Slicing Winds and Smackerel and stuff. Smackerel, Smackerel just needs to do less damage. I think that one's pretty straightforward, but Slicing Winds, I don't think the damage is the problem. I think the cooldown is the problem. It's just that you can dart around the map way too quickly, especially with Epic Slicing Winds in the late game, 
I think its cooldown just overall needs to be increased by a considerable amount. That way you can still make good plays with it. You can still use it as a way to evade people, but you're not just completely uncatchable and unhittable effectively if you're darting around somebody. That is the biggest thing that just makes it so oppressive if you know how to use it correctly. Uh, but yeah, that's it. I hope you enjoyed the tier list. If you did, make sure to throw it a like. That way other people can find it as well. And if you want to see more Plunderstorm stuff, I'm probably not going to be covering it a lot on my main channel, but I have been posting a lot of Plunderstorm gameplay and like little tips and tricks on my second channel, just because that's more fun and laid back. And I can just make like, you know, a short, relatively low effort unedited video that still people can find entertaining. So if you are interested in Plunderstorm and you want to see more stuff like that, go check out my second channel. Link is in the description. Maybe you'll find something you like. But that's it. Hope you enjoyed it. See you in the next one. Peace.